I mean, it was great to meet you at the Skokie Chamber yeah. of Commerce, and yeah, welcome likewise. to the show. Um, because when we met, I was so intrigued. I remember meeting you because you you started talking about healthcare in a way that's not normal for most doctors. Sure, you were talking about relationships and relationship based healthcare. And then I looked on your website, and that's what you're all about. And, you know, so much of the time, I mean, and I think I told you that my primary care doctor is a waste of time. I'm basically my primary care doctor, and I'm just so frustrated with healthcare in so many ways in this country. And you started talking about that, and it was so intriguing. And I believe that... um, your the uh, your clinic is called Bridge Direct Care, right? Correct. Co- located yeah. in Evanston, yep. and it says relationship based healthcare. And it, I remember when I emailed you, <clears throat> and I asked you, um, you know, we're doing this um, series on incentive structures, and one of the parts of society we want to deal with is healthcare. And you said, "quote I think, write, and speak about the misaligned incentives in healthcare a lot." which is part of what drove me to start my own practice. Yeah. So before I go into your um, practice, which I definitely am going to ask about, I just wanted to um, give our audience, if you could give our audience a bit of your background and sure. um, what inspired you to get into healthcare to begin with. Yeah, no, that's great. And, and thanks so much for having me. Oh, sure. Um, so I, I guess... St- Starting um, in my childhood, my dad was a family doctor. Okay, st- still is, but not practicing anymore. But um, I grew up in in Pennsylvania. Okay, in a <clears throat> small city slash small town in in uh, called Wilkes-Barre, okay. Pennsylvania, in the northeastern corner there. Um, and I I think um, probably subconsciously I um, I saw the. Uh, I went on house calls with my dad. I oh, would, I, I would go about what age? Um, I mean, I was young, you know, like six, seven, eight years old. I remember going, mm. you know, and I I saw him interacting with patients and him going to nursing homes and sort of following his patients whether they were in the hospital or at home. Mm. Mm. I remember this one time going. One of his patients was in the ER and he went in and sutured them up in the emergency room. And just the, the sort of you can see patients, um, you know, when they see somebody that they know, and and the the I have like vivid memories of of their face sort of lighting up, or, or at least if they were in a tough situation, at least mm. being comforted by seeing him. And I think he worked a lot, but he he sort of you know his his metric <laughs> for like how he he did his work was, was based off like the panel that he, the patients that he cared for. So, mm. um, you know, nobody else in my family went into health. I have two brothers. They didn't go into healthcare. I, I, uh. I didn't really think that much consciously about uh-huh. my dad when I was making decisions. I, I, <laughs> but I, um, yeah, <laughs> I, um, I can relate to that by the way. I mean, yeah. I went into production. My father was a television producer, so I was just like, I never really thought about it, but people are like, well, you sure? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> well, so what about like, what years were you like, um, were you going around with your father initially? Like what year are we talking about? Cause it's interesting because it seems, he seems to epitomize relationship based healthcare. Yeah, no, exactly. And I, and I sort of came around to that e- even in recent years thinking about, Oh, I'm really trying to do what he once had. So this is, I mean, he was a doctor in the eighties and nineties okay. in, okay. um, in Pennsylvania. Okay. Um, and then he, um, and then I left, you know, Pennsylvania around, um, in the late nineties. Okay. And, um, Ended up going to med school and, and did residency in the early 2000s. You went to um, Northwestern? I went I went to, so I was in Philadelphia. I went to Temple. And okay. And I went to Jefferson for residency. Okay. Um, I did a grad school program in Northwestern okay. um, oh, later, gotcha. but that gotcha. that was, that actually formed a lot of, um, you know, the, the things I mentioned in my email with the misaligned incentives. I, oh. I, I got a grad school degree in quality and safety. Um, oh. And so there I learned a lot about systems thinking and, um, and design and, and certain things that you don't think a lot about. And what about what years did you attend this program? Um, that was 2013 to 2015. Okay, so this, would you characterize that type of thinking, that type of program at Northwestern as 
progressive, more thinking outside the conventional wisdom at the time? Were they doing things that made doctors rethink how healthcare should be practiced? Yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, that's um, very encouraging. It's a small, it's a small program. Okay. I mean, there was probably tw- twenty of us in my graduating class. Okay. Um, and it was pretty sort of focused on mm. how do we make healthcare better. Um, oh, that's a nice, yeah, objective. Um, and so it wasn't, you know, a lot of um, people who are doctors who who want to think about the system might get a public health degree or an MBA, and mm-hmm. this was. This was a little bit more focused. I, I took some some classes with MBA students, and and I um, and then I took classes through the medical school. Mm. Um, but yeah, it was, it was pretty focused on um, on quality measurement and and designing systems and designing um, and human centered design concepts like that that I had never heard of. Oh, that's before. terrific! Yeah. Well, I first wanted to um, tackle you know in order to um, you know the 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 system that needs to be transformed because um, there seems to be a barrage of obstacles, um, you know, in our current everyday healthcare system to having doctors really do what they they went to medical school for, which is to care for patients. I mean, you know, I you know I heard this term a long time ago in terms of the way in which healthcare is administered really and largely controlled by insurance companies, unfortunately. I mean, the term medical mafia comes to mind because it <laughs> takes advantage of people at their most vulnerable state, which seems to make sense. However, um, you know, everybody has different ver- uh, different views of that. But it seems to be about, and I think I talked to you about this benefits program, pharmaceutical benefits program, when we met at the Skokie Chamber of Commerce. But... Um, It seems like the uh, health insurance companies are managing, you know, they have this term managed care, and it seems like they're managing profits, not really managing people's health care and wellness. So I'm wondering, like, before we go into the things that you do in your clinic, what are some of the obstacles that get in the way of doctors really practicing medicine in the way that's most helpful to the patients? Yeah, that's a good question. And there's it's such a complex system. Um, and I, I, I think that I, the, the probably the frame that I think a lot about is, mm-hmm. um, is based off of a, a thinker and, and leader in mm-hmm. the healthcare space called Don Berwick. His name's Don Berwick. Okay. He's, um, he founded the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and was the head administrator at, at Medicare and Medicaid for during the Obama years for a okay. year. And, um, he also he him and his organization came up with the idea of the triple aim, which anyway he's 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 a knight in the British um, uh, in Britain too because he, oh. he's just he's a renowned figure. Oh, okay, he wrote an article called um, Era Three, and I think it was called that. It's something about the the first and second eras of healthcare um, and how we need to move beyond them. And so I think it's worth explaining because it's a framework that oh, I think please. a lot about. Please, um, so Era One was. The era of my dad, <laughs> mm. um, the professional, the physician was sort of empowered and entrusted by society exactly. to, to do the right thing for for their patients, and um, it worked. It worked well in some ways, and then mm. in around <clears throat> two thousand, around the turn of the century, mm-hmm. there was a few like um, reports put out by the Institute of Medicine mm-hmm. that basically said. Healthcare is not as safe as we thought it was, and we're causing harm to people, medical errors and whatnot, okay. and then it's not as high quality as we thought it was. And so mm. not everybody had access to somebody like my dad, so it wasn't equitable necessarily, mm. um, and and we didn't have measurement. We weren't really measuring. A doctor might thought they were doing well, but they weren't necessarily, they didn't know, did their treatment work or not. Mm. So. We, you know, we, we had to move, healthcare had to shift into the era of, of, of measurement and, okay. and, and accountability in some ways, or I shouldn't say it that way. There was, a, there, there was reasons to, to shift from this idea where the doctor knows what's best to, hmm, like how can we actually know that we're doing, you know, our patients, doing good for our patients, doing well by My our patients. My radar is up. Yeah, I'm very concerned about where you're going with this. Um, so then, Era Two came about, and I think that's okay. where we're going to spend our time talking, like what you're sort of alluding to. And Era Two is sort of the the 
you know, it shifted completely onto this other side where it's the era of, of sort of scrutiny and accountability and, and external measurement. Which seems on its surface rational to some degree. Seems rational to go in that direction. It, okay. It, but when you overshoot and, and you have sort of m- minimalistic or um, measures that are basically um, not representative of what people want in their health care, mm-hmm. um, you know, you're not measuring whether or not you built trust with your, your doctor. You're mm-hmm. measuring <clears throat> things that are easy to measure, like pap smears and mammograms. And, okay. And um, whether or not you were asked whether you were, uh, say, depression screening, those sorts of things. So you're asking things, you're, you're measuring things that are easier to measure that are important. Um, mm-hmm. Sure. You know, nobody's going to argue against um, getting cancer screening on on you know, people who, who meet the criteria to get cancer screening, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um, age criteria and whatnot. But that's such a small sort of thin um, piece of healthcare. Mm. There's so much more. Mm. And so I, I think that's what's happened is you basically shifted from sort of this, this era where doctors and patients, there wasn't a lot getting in between doctors and patients. You know, if you were there and you had a good therapeutic relationship, you know, a doctor could sit there and look at you and listen and, and, and you could build a human bond mm-hmm. and a human interaction that al- allows them to better, you know, understand what's going on with you and, and mm-hmm. come to a, a decision about how to best support you. Mm-hmm. Um, this day and age, there's all these electronic, you know, medical records that have then taken this, um, all of these measurements and sort of force that into the, the doctor-patient relationship. So when I am a doctor taking care of a patient with a medical record, I'm sort of told, maybe not directly, but inform- uh, indirectly, that I should be asking you all of these questions. Mm. Um, and it sort of gets in between, you know, uh, the doctor and the patient and, and the, the interaction that they were having before. Can you give us an example of something that yeah. might get in the way? Um, and you and I think the term that I'm, I, th- I read in some of the articles you sent me to, to um, just get up to speed on what your perspective is on uh, EHR, electronic health records. Yeah, is exactly. that right? Yeah. Okay, please. Yeah, sorry, I know I'm using terms. Oh, no, are, no, that's quite um, all right. So, yeah, the, the, it's actually, uh, and I'll give you an example, but mm-hmm. it's interesting that I, I've hypothesized in some of the work that I've done and the research that we've done that the EHR, the electronic health record, mm-hmm. and this movement, this quality movement, this, this movement to, to better measure quality and report on quality mm-hmm. happened at around the same time, early 2000s. Okay. So you have these two things happening, and they, they <clears throat> sort of feed off each other. So there's this quality movement. Hey, we should, we should be measuring these things. Well, then it gets put into an EMR, which then inserts itself, or an EHR, which then inserts uh-huh. itself into the interaction. So those two things happening simultaneously, I think, is part of the challenge. And we, we don't really understand what we don't have a 100% full picture of what quality is in healthcare and yet we're implementing all of these things that are partial are parts of the puzzle so which to which what you're alluding to are unfortunately the the uh, impetus to do this might have been from a good coming from a good place but now it's getting in the way and what are some examples where this e, these yeah. mandated questions that you have to ask might get in the way of your you know healthcare I think that I've, you're providing I could think of a a few um you know, I I went to my doctor the first time that I saw him, um, mm-hmm. and I remember him asking me a series of questions. One of which was whether or not I wear sunscreen. Okay. And <laughs> okay. And I felt seems like, rather innocuous. Yeah, and and but I I felt like it was you know he probably had 15, 20 some <clears throat> questions that he was he was sort of going through. And it felt fine, but it, it felt like he was trying to get through it, and I didn't really feel like the questions were that important to me. Uh-huh. Um, and, and, and fast forwarding to my current practice now, where, I, where I'm um, in bridge drug care, uh-huh. when I meet a patient, we sit down, they've given me a bunch of information ahead of time, I ask them, and, and, and I think the idea of filling out questionnaires I don't think is a bad thing. I think the idea of filling out a questionnaire and then you feel like some, nobody's actually reading it, I feel like a lot of patients... Um, might be feeling that this day and age. They're writing down their information a lot and, you know, where is it going? For me, I, I have patients do that and I really study them and read them. And then when I meet them, we have a conversation. Mm, mm-hmm. And instead of being, instead of me asking them a series of very medical questions, my opening question is, tell me about yourself. Tell me your story. I love that. 
um, like, who are you? Uh-huh. And, um, you know, in, 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 in those sorts of terms. And so some patients will start um, talking about, you know, like their adulthood. And then, you know, I, I then further probe um, later on in the interview, well, tell me about your childhood. And, and so really trying to get to know who this person is as a person, mm-hmm. not only as a patient. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Because it seems like if you're going through a checklist, it's it's so like subconscious where you can kind of withdraw from the interaction that's right in front of you yeah. as opposed to being present, which yeah. is most important. And I guess in a subtle way and not so subtle way that can take people away from being present with the other human being, which is critical for, you know, doing um, practicing uh, healthcare for real in yeah. a genuine way. Yeah. Exactly. So. Um, you sent me, and this kind of, you're alluding to the problem with metrics, and um, you sent me an article that you helped to write called <clears throat> The Solution Shop and the Production Line, The Case for a Frame Ship for Physician Practices. And <clears throat> um, this is really interesting. There's a blurb here that I just wanted to read for our audience. It says, <clears throat> the shifting I find... The shifting of financial resources within the U.S. healthcare system away from direct patient care, particularly non-procedural care, and toward technology companies, data aggregators, insurance, <clears throat> and pharmaceutical providers, and performance measurement subcontractors reduces the funds available to physician practices to support the team structure, stability, and skill levels needed to manage the majority of the production line work. Thus, as performance measurement has grown, which is what you're alluding to, billing has become more complex and third-party entities such as insurance companies and commercial pharmacies have automated their processes at the expense of clinical practices. Physicians have been tasked with a growing volume of production line work. The tension be... This really struck me. It said the tension between... These two poles contributes to moral distress and burnout. Could you speak to that a little bit? Because that's really, really intense. And, you know, you were talking about these two forces coming together. Like, we want to have healthcare better, which seems like a great initiative. And now the the um, to quantify it and to measure it seems like a rational thing to do. But unfortunately, it's actually been detrimental to the practice of healthcare. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, I think. I think that there's there's a few things in there. There's the um, the bureaucracy that has formed. Um, there is this creation of a lot of of middle <coughs> men or middle persons, um, gender neutral. There, um, <laughs> middle people. <laughs> middle people. That not little people. Middle people. <laughs> <laughs> that um, you know that 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 in some ways we're inserted at some point to help with some piece of the puzzle but but have at, at this point are creating a lot of what i think are unnecessary what i think is unnecessary bureaucracy and mm, so mm. they're um and it, and it has to do with in some ways the way that we pay for health care and in, in other ways just the the way that um you know quality and performance measurement was was instituted and so you know there's there's a lot in that passage that that has to do with like payment and insurance companies but there's some of it that just has to do with performance measurement Mm -hmm. and and um i think that what we what me and dr sinsky meant when we when we talked about that um sort of the production line and the solution shop did he help write this she yeah she i'm Um, forgive me yeah we we co-wrote it we had Uh sort of um, toyed with some of these ideas for for a while, both of us individually and then together over the course of maybe a few years, and then this this came together. Mm. Um, both we both have a shared interest in this this idea, but um, the idea that the the production line, which is let's say um, the things that we know we want our population to do, I mentioned cancer screening before. Um, mm-hmm. There are you know a bunch of um, <coughs> other measures of like, for example, a diabetic should get a foot exam and should get an eye exam mm-hmm. and should get, um, you know, uh, annually basically, and, and should, um, have other testing. And then there's other people with chronic disease who have a, a list of things that they should get. Okay. Um, and 
making sure that you do all of those things in the middle of a human interaction, sometimes um, you're multitasking in a way that that um, can be overwhelming and can hurt the the human interaction. Mm-hmm. Um, those examples I gave were actually ones that most clinicians would agree should be done. But then there's a whole host of other things mm. that, you know, for example, assessing somebody's preferred learning style. Um, that's actually something in electronic medical records mm. where you're supposed to, and, and it, it it's well-meaning, like if, if a patient sure. doesn't um, understand what it is that you're trying to communicate to them in, in whatever format, um, their, how are they going to be empowered or engaged in, in, a, in, in their own health care? Mm. Um, mm. so, but when it becomes a measure that you have to check in an EMR, it, it can become forced. It can become, you know, mm. like, oh, what's your, what's your learning style? And, and this happened to me. I was actually in a room. So I, ha- I had the situation where I was, um, happened to be in the room with a medical assistant when she was rooming the patient at the beginning of the, of the visit in, in, um, and this is, you know, probably about five years ago, because um, at the start of the day, I, I, I wanted to jumpstart my day. So I just sort of sat in the corner, let the medical assistant do her thing with the patient. Mm-hmm. Um, but she was asking these this series of questions, you know, okay. like wh- did a did some questions to assess for depression and anxiety and then asked the patient, <laughs> what's your preferred learning style? And the patient sort of looked at her with a confused look and said, what? And. And she said, you know, like, how do you like to learn? <laughs> and the patient's like, uh, I don't know. And and she's like, like, are you a visual learner? Are you a verbal learner? Do you learn by experience? And, I mean, it went back and forth several times. And then finally, the medical assistant sort of pinned down the patient and had an answer that she could put into the medical record. Not that we did anything with that information. You know, we didn't, right. we don't have the... Um, the systems in place to, to create, you know, catered learning materials for a certain type of learner versus another type of learner. Uh-huh. So it was really literally just to check a box that she was told. To and check. that's really the issue about checking boxes as opposed to, it seems to be well-meaning. And if like, I think the healthcare practitioner, whether that be the doctor or the assistant, they should have the latitude to realize that it's not going anywhere and we don't need to check the box and it might be helpful, but it's not that helpful. What are you talking about? Do I learn better like swinging from the ceiling? I don't know. What are you talking about? And then she's given examples and the person's still confused exactly. and now there's tension and now anxiety might be ramping up and say, like, am I not answering the question? I don't understand what you're saying. And then all of a sudden they feel like they're not knowing what to do, and then there's, like, distance. And, you know, what's interesting is the distance that happens between people can be so subtle. Yeah. And it, and, and anything, and when you were talking about these checklists that you got to get through, anything that create like, if, for instance, when I would teach people how to interview at Northwestern Journalism School, yeah. I would say, Don't ever, ever, like, people often will say, will this be edited? You just say, absolutely. Don't ever laugh. Don't ever joke and say, oh, yeah, of course, yeah, we'll definitely, you know, or anything like that. Why? Because if they feel at all slighted Mm -hmm. in any way, even if it's slight, they might withdraw. Yeah. And that slight withdrawal might, like, cost you later in the interview some gold that they would have given you. But all of a sudden, they're a little bit more withdrawn. So now you got to work against that and around that to get them to be present again with you and to trust you. And these things can be subtle, but yet be costly. So yeah. that that's what came to mind when you're talking. Yeah, I mean, and as you're talking, I'm thinking of a few, a few things like, and I hadn't really thought about this before you said what you were saying. Um <clears throat> After the medical assistant left, the patient sort of looked at me and said, like, can we now get on with, like, why I'm here today? Um, <laughs> totally. Exactly. And, and it's, it, it's fascinating because it, it's the opportunity cost, like, that you mm-hmm. spend this time talking about these things that, that we don't really care about. Like, we... we we care theoretically their their preferred learning style, but we don't. We're not using that information, so we're not really. We don't really care about it in the short term. We're not doing anything with that information, and the patient doesn't care. And so we're spending time. And I think you're right. The the medical assistant, um, who who are 
who our medical assistants are extremely talented and mm-hmm. um, and could add a lot to encounters. And, and since that time, five years ago, we really shifted to say, you know what? Ask the patient why they're here. Get to know them. Build a rapport. Mm-hmm. Like that. That's the human side. That's the mm-hmm. sort of helping more with the solution shop that we talked mm-hmm. about in our article. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I think that that this idea that there's a bunch of things that we have to get through. Mm-hmm. Um, most of which are, all of which are well-meaning, some of which are valuable and some of which are maybe waste, you mm-hmm. know, at this current juncture. <clears throat> that, all of that stuff competes with this human interaction and this, totally. this rapport building and, and, and they don't, it doesn't have to be that way. And, and who's managing, who's mandating? Is that directly from the insurance companies? Is that how it's rolling out or? Yeah, I, th- I think that, um, I think <clears throat> that the, this is why it's complicated, is it's not, mm. Some of it is um, a misinterpretation of a regulation. So, for example, mm. or, or an old metric that um, was put in place that is no longer you know, required, but it was put in place. So who mandated it is a good question. Hmm. Um, there are, just to give an example, there mm. is something called a patient-centered medical home. Um, it's a, have you ever heard of the term? Say, say that again. Patient-centered medical home. Okay. No, I've not. So basically, the patient-centered medical home um, is is a was initially a theoretical construct, okay. um, and it became a set of measures. And that's actually the interesting where I think it it, it, it ran into some trouble. And so, um, primary care. I'm going to go backwards. <laughs> sure. Be, before the patient-centered medical home, there was this idea of the what what is good primary care, and this you know is what I'm trying to um, create in my new practice. And mm-hmm. And this, this woman named Barbara Starfield, I think in the 1990s, came up with this concept. Good primary care is first contact. Like when you have an issue, you go to this, this person or this office because mm-hmm. you, you reach out to them. You call <clears throat> them, whatever, because you have mm-hmm. an issue. They're your first person. They're your, they're your person, you know, or they're your, they're your team. First contact, that's the first C. Mm-hmm. Second one is comprehensive. You okay. can go to them for anything. Okay. You know, even if they need to refer you on, you can you can bring anything to them. So right. Third one is is coordinated. Okay. So they help coordinate your care. If you go to a specialist, they're still aware. They're still involved. Uh-huh. And fourth is um, is is continuous. So they're it's not it's not a few days that they know you, but they know you over long periods of time, over years. So good primary care. I, I think most people that would resonate with them. Those four C's are good primary care. Sounds terrific, actually. <laughs> so then you move into the model of the patient-centered medical home. So it was this idea of, you know, how do we, how do, we do that in, in bigger practices, in health centers, where I've been mm-hmm. working for several years, where you have these large, you know, larger offices with multiple providers. Well, we want to create a patient-centered medical home. We want to create within these larger offices a way that people can say, yeah, that's my doctor, that's my team. Mm. I'm gonna, I could get in touch with, the, with them when I need it. I could continue mm-hmm. have a continuous relationship with them. Mm-hmm. The problem was, and so I, I really resonated with me. I was actually the pa- the PCMH, the Patient Center Medical Home Physician Champion for for a health center that I worked with. In this is around 2012, um, but I found that I was being sort of told at the time. Um, we need to make sure that we hit all of these measures. And the measures were things like, did, you, did we figure out whether the patient, what the patient's preferred learning style is? Did we figure out what their health literacy level is? Um, okay. You know, these, these sort of process metrics, like measures of like the process, but the outcome that mattered was the four C's. And we were, uh-huh. and, and so it just became, and, and this is a concept that, uh, you know, there's, there's a technical term. I don't know if I should use it here just because I don't want to be too technical. But sure. um, it's called surrogation. Yes, um, I was going to. Oh, believe me, I was going to bring up that technical oh, term okay. for sure. I found that fascinating. Could you just speak to that, please? Sure. And it's Absolutely. something I've, I've been fascinated Because this with. isn't just re- in relationship to healthcare. Yeah. This is business or whatever. Please. Yeah. So I, I, I learned of the term. Um, ba- there's an article in Harvard Business Review, and, yep. it, and they talked about um, they talked about. Uh, um, sorry, I'm blanking on the company Volkswagen, right? Uh, Wasn't the it bank. a bank? Um, Wells Fargo. That's right. That's they, right. They yes. talked about Wells yes, Fargo yes. and the idea that Wells Fargo, 
their goal their their goal was long term relationships, mm-hmm. customer relationships. Mm-hmm. Their measure was like, well, if we if we cross sell, you know, if we if we have page, if we have uh, somebody who's who's using one of these products, let's cross sell them for another one of our products. That will help us with that. That's more of a relationship with the patient, but it it backfired because, you know, there was there was fraud involved. <laughs> yeah, there's um, criminal activity, yeah. so they took it to but, another level. But at least, Wells I mean, Fargo. <laughs> oh my God, <laughs> and I'm not an expert. I don't, you know, yeah, it was it against, was pretty but, bad. Yeah, I kind of was privy to that situation when I read the article. It's like, oh yeah, but I understand. Like they got kind of a, a he, a over their heads, uh, uh, over their skis. You know, they're yeah. like, yeah, it was like detrimental, but. It seemed to be like, yeah, let's really serve the client. Yeah, like the goal was was aspirational. The goal was good, and I mm-hmm. think that's the piece. The patient centered medical home is exactly that. It's mm-hmm. it's this great aspirational goal. And when I think about my father's practice from my childhood, mm-hmm. he, you know, that 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 is a patient centered medical home. That you know, and it's it totally that, that is the four C's of primary care. Um, but the problem is, it, it's it's hard to measure, you know, some of the important things in healthcare like trust and relationships and and one of the mm-hmm. things that the, just to give an example the, mm-hmm. in the patient centered medical home you do measure continuity so you do measure how oh. many visits do i have with my doctor mm. this year it's a yearly measure mm. so if your doctor changes every year and you see them you know five times let's say three times in the year you saw the same doctor <clears throat> that was your doctor and mm-hmm. the next year that person left the practice because they were burnt out or mm-hmm. um, and you switch doctors every year. Well, as a patient, and that happened eight years in a row, you wouldn't feel like you knew your doctor that well, but you, they would be scoring perfectly on their patient centered medical home measure mm-hmm. of continuity mm-hmm. because it's only based off that calendar year. And so it's, it's, it, it's not that measurement isn't important, but I think that, um, the way in which it's measured is critical because, I mean, this really reminds me of, I mean, how, um, you know, traditional uh, educate, classical education is implemented in this country, which is kind of, a um, you know, held over from the Industrial Revolution where it's orderly and you get the grade and the evaluation. But oftentimes, you know, teachers and I've I've taught, you know, high school, yeah. uh, undergrad, graduate level courses and um you know, it's so easy to get wrapped up in the grade and the metrics and did they do this and did do that, but are you really properly evaluating the student? So if they get a a D on a test, but two days or three days later, they really learn from their mistakes, and if they got to take it again, they would get a B or an A. Yeah. Why should they be evaluated that they got a D? What is the point of the grade? It seems like a punitive measure. Yeah. It doesn't seem to actually... um, provide what is needed, which is to accurately represent what a student is really learning. But like you got them at like a midway point in the learning process when they were still formulating their idea. It's kind of like taking a piano student and having them like learn a song. And then they're halfway through and you grade them and you're like, and that's it. Now we're going to move on to the next song yeah. and you you got a D. <laughs> and then like a week later, they play it flawlessly and could perform it in front of people for a, a, like a, a live performance where people pay money. But no, yeah, you got a bad grade because that's when we evaluated you. And it seems really counterintuitive yeah. and ridiculous. Yeah. So it seems like people get real. It's so sorry. Let me just like define this. I remember... Um, I remember reading about um, surrogation. It's really the 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 tension between metrics versus strategy, um, and the incentive structure seems to focus on metrics rather than strategy. So it's surrogation. Just getting back to this technical term, the tendency to mentally replace strategy with metrics called surrogation is quite pervasive. In fact, research tells us that whenever metrics are present, people tend to surrogate and it can destroy company value. Hmm. Um, There's a reduced accuracy of intake screening questionnaires tied to quality metrics, as you were talking about, and focusing on incentivized process process measures like intake screening questionnaires leads to repetitive and we hypothesize in your article, I believe, inaccurate completion. And something else really, really struck me, and let me just read this to you. So it kind of 
<clears throat> gives our audience a better picture of what we're talking about. <clears throat> and I think this is from your article. Yeah. The impact on outcomes that matter, reducing more mortality and morbidity from depression and anxiety, may not be as favorable as previously perceived. An ineffective screening may unintentionally detract from clinical care because care teams and patients have less time and cognitive energy to focus on other priorities during busy clinical encounters. I mean, this is like speaking directly to what you're talking about. Yeah. And it just really gets in the way of this human interaction, which should be the, the center stone for everything. Yeah. yeah, I definitely agree. I mean, I, and I want to go back to the education thing for a second, because I, I think, and and then go into surrogation, then into this sure, article. Sure, please, please. Um, the when what you were saying about education made me think. Yeah, the purpose of education, like I think that the the reason that we do education is is learning, right? You, you, let's like, get clear on that. That's let's the get goal. present, right? Learning, and <laughs> and so we do measurement to, um, you know, grading right. to. Um, to help us on that path to learning for, for various reasons. But I think you're right. Your kind point was... Kind of see was, where we're at. Yeah. yeah which is and, fine. And then, and then to help, you know, to help... I mean, it could be a tool for learning. Hmm, this person needs more help. Yada, right, yada, right, yada. right. Um, and, but it becomes, yeah, it becomes punitive and it becomes the focus really in a lot of ways. Yeah, and like, also the damage that's done when a kid gets the grade... Yeah. And also, there's authority um, relationship with the doctor to the patient, for sure. And if the patient's picking up that the doctor's kind of like not fully there through these metrics, it can exacerbate the situation. Yeah. I mean, I remember, you know, like, uh, just to kind of add to that, when I took over teaching um, English literature and poetry and creative writing at a high school, um, actually in Central America, the outgoing nice. teacher said... Don't teach them creative writing. They're not good at this. Yeah. And I re immediately ignored him <laughs> and started a writing uh, yeah. workshop. So instead of having them write something creative and give it back to them with a grade, I had them write. I would pull them. I would go outside with them when they had a draft ready. I'd read it, give them feedback, and then they'd go work on it and work on it and work on it yeah. and work on it. And they, it was unbelievable how incredible the writing um was from the students they were lit up that like so many of this there's one young man in particular that was so apathetic about school and i was like why is he so apathetic i don't get yeah. it he's really bright and everything well he just wasn't inspired and some he was so his writing was some of the best in the school yeah. i mean it was phenomenal all i'm saying is if you lose sight of the real purpose of what you're doing it's so easy to get tied down into the metrics of it and the evaluation of it and lose sight of the strategy yeah. and the, the actual real objective, the fundamental objective. It's so easy to do that. It's amazing. Yeah, totally. And I, and I think what you're getting at there, the, the, one thing is, the one thing that I change when I talk about surrogation from the article is, mm. is replace the word strategy with goals. Because strategy yeah, yes. makes sense in the business context. Yes. But I think the idea of like, what are we aiming for? What's the goal of, and I, I think about education all the time, you know, in the parallel, um, you know, I, I want my, my, I have three kids who are in, you know, school aged and mm -hmm. I want them to be learning. I don't, I, you know, I, I feel like the teachers this day and age have a lot of sort of things that they have to keep track of and that they're reporting back to parents. And I'm like, you know, I would be okay if they spent less time writing an email to me and more time use that time, you know, focused on on teaching. The, because the it children. can like inhibit their intellectual curiosity. Yeah. I talk to my pa uh, my parents, my kids, yeah. all the time about this traditional model of education that they're in, and that I'm very concerned that it is going to uh, stunt their intellectual curiosity. Yeah. And I just I'm very frank with them yeah, about it. Yeah. Just don't let them do that. Don't let the system um, wear you down in terms of your your zest to learn. And yeah. that really um, is uh, a big concern for me. And the best teachers I, that our kids have had have been very aware of the paradigm that they're working on yeah. and doing the best to be flexible with it. So like you're working in a system of American healthcare and you've started, how long did you, when did you start your own practice? This past summer. 
Whoa! So, so this is relatively new. So okay, so <laughs> let, let's 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 delve into that. What did you? What were some of the main things that drove? So obviously, you have a lot of issues with the conventional way healthcare is administered. So, what were the, some of the main mantras and and reasons why you started your own health? And what did you want to implement like from the beginning to transform the space and the way you practice medicine? Yeah, I mean, I. Th- I think it's a combination of of things, some of which we've already been talking sure. about. But I, you know, out of out of residency in 2009, I, I moved to Ethiopia. My wife and I moved oh. um, to rural Ethiopia. I, I was interested, and still am, in in sort of healthcare as as a tool for social justice. Right? Like we mm. we as doctors um, could be on the front lines and 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 help you know, not only with illness, but the things that can contribute to illness, right? So, um, uh, you know, um, systemic injustices, et cetera. Sure. Um, and so being there, though, I didn't realize, I had learned that the, I thought I was going, the, the, the difficulty for me in Ethiopia would be learning how to treat tropical diseases or, or diseases that are that are um, endemic there that aren't here, like tuberculosis and, mm. and typhoid and <clears throat> malaria and and I learned those things. I, I had been taught going back to education to learn mm-hmm. how to learn, you know, in medical school, like how do you learn? And, mm-hmm. and you know, um, had more of a growth mindset, which is, you know, hopefully what our children are learning these days. But um, I, I, I also learned about management and incentives, weirdly. And that might be a whole other conversation. The, the incentives in, in rural Ethiopia where there were sort of single disease programs. Mm-hmm. Um, for example, HIV is, you know, <clears throat> was at catastrophic levels and, and hopefully is doing better these days. But mm-hmm. so there's a lot of money in HIV, which was, which was good. Um, but it, it ended up distorting our, our local health center economy. We were a rural health center mm-hmm. and we had a limited number of staff <clears throat> and all of our staff always wanted to go to the HIV trainings, okay. um, all of them. And I was like, why do, but we have babies to deliver and patients okay. to see. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we had like five nurses or, or six or seven nurses and all of them wanted to go to each one of these trainings. And we're like, and, and they technically could have, they, and, and, um, from, from the trainer standpoint and the trainers would pay them money, mm. um, when they go. So they'd get paid a per diem. So basically, and, and what we found out was that was basically like a, their <laughs> monthly salary to go to this day training. So, mm-hmm. Um, so I, I learned again, this is probably a whole nother conversation we could oh, sit please. down and have, but, please. but, um, you know, I, I, it was eye opening when I went to one of the trainings and they handed me money and these are, you know, funding that comes from the U S and other developed mm, nations mm, that, mm-hmm. that are well intended again. Mm-hmm. But I started learning about like, Oh, the reason why these people want to go, there's these, you know, there's obviously a financial incentive for them to like not come to work, but to go to this training. <laughs> um, and it was hard to fight against that. And so I guess I, at the time I was just learning about systems, you know, and incentives mm-hmm. and whatnot and, sure. and, and human motivation. And, mm-hmm. and so I, I think after that point, um, I, I became interested in, in, in those sorts of larger system forces and I ended up going to grad school. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I came back to the U.S. and I was mm-hmm. working on the electronic medical record and mm-hmm. the patient center medical home okay. transition, um, as well as being a doctor. And and I, you know, I had this thought. I was like, How long ago did you go through the Northwestern program? By the way, 2013 to 2015. Uh, okay, go ahead. So you know, around 2010, I came back. I started having my wife and I started having a family, and and I. Mm-hmm. And I found the contrast between Ethiopia and the U.S. Um, fascinating in some ways. And I, I can give mm. you a few stories, but I, so in, in Ethiopia, I had extremely sick patients. I mean, I had, mm. it, it's heartbreaking, the, the low resources that we had. I, countless people died under our watch, mm. children, and mm-hmm. it was, you know, it's it very sad. Um but also, you know, some amazing stories of, you know, patients would come in with tuberculosis, would be extremely skinny. They looked like they had end stage cancer, end stage cancer. We had the treatment for them. We would treat them. We would house them near our clinic even. Mm. It was it was pretty inexpensive to do that. And we had a social committee. Mm-hmm. 
these patients would make miraculous recoveries. Same with mm-hmm. the malnourished children. Some of the malnourished children, we would be able to like turn them around. Their 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 bodies look completely different within a few matter of weeks or months. Mm-hmm. Um, and and it was it was great to watch those successes. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a simple system. A patient would come in. We had the pharmacy. We had a lab. We had an inpatient unit. So in order to we. For the things that we could treat, it was really simple, very simple system, and you were able to pass people on. And then I came back to and I came back to the U.S. and I started. I worked in Chicago. I worked. I worked at a health center. I worked with you know patients who were usually at or below the federal poverty limit. Um, mm-hmm. So definitely people with less means, and and that was where my passion was and and still is. Um, you know, caring for people who can't. Um, um, you know, afford the system often. Mm -hmm. Um, anyway, they, um, it was simple and we came here, it was probably way more complicated. And then I found myself (laughs) documenting on these electronic medical records, like all of lunch and then two hours at night, you know, and just bogged down. It's just, and I I felt like the reason I was documenting wasn't actually helping patients. It was just that the, the templates that I had to fill out were so long, you know, every time I did a physical exam for an, an infant, I had to document like 20 points on a physical exam, mm-hmm. just lots of boxes to fill out. Mm-hmm. And so I, I, it just didn't feel right. Like in Ethiopia, I could take a lunch break, a mental pause in the day, mm-hmm. eat some lunch, and then, ex, you know, except if a be- uh, baby was being delivered. But, but other than a, an emergency, <laughs> which happens sometimes, but which felt fine. You know, if there's sure, a sure. real need to of actually course. help, feels good. Oh, but if, that's what but you're to, there for. Just to document all you know, ex- excessively. So I think a lot of us are still feeling that this day and age, you know? Um, but I, I, anyway, that's what led me to go to grad school. And I, and I did this work. Um, you know, I did, I did this, um, got training on, on healthcare quality and patient safety. Mm, mm-hmm. Um, and I think since then I've just been trying to change this, the system. I had the opportunity to work at um, I've moved around a little bit, but I, I had an opportunity to work at um, some organizations that at the time were sort of startup um, mm-hmm. healthcare organizations mm-hmm. that um, were doing things differently. And I learned a lot from working at both of those. And mm-hmm. then I came back to the health center space mm-hmm. six years ago and we created an innovation center to try to change things. Um, but I find that the the way we get paid at health centers and in sort of a lot of the, you mentioned before, insurance companies or the regulators who who create the measures that we, the it's it's very hard to mm-hmm. to change within that that system. And so you I gotta, you basically have to create a new system. You basically have to create a new system. And uh-huh. we tried to create an innovation center uh-huh. so that we could like within the bigger system do things differently. Um, but it's it's hard to do that. And I and I, by the way, something that you mentioned in one of in one of the articles that you sent me that struck me that you're really alluding to that didn't say specifically, which is you're a trained medical doctor yeah, and you're spending a lot of time doing things that your training isn't meant for you to do. Yeah. And so you're spending, I mean, you're a valuable asset to the community because of your training and because of what you want to do to help people with their health. Yeah. And, and you're, filling out these damn forms yeah yeah no exactly i think the amount of time that you spend and th- that goes back to insurance companies there are a lot of you know because you brought that up earlier like doing uh prior authorizations or or you know forms that you have to fill out uh-huh. because right some somebody requires them and and that oh, that yeah you know so so yeah i think <laughs> Somebody, <laughs> um, you know, whether it's like a, a form that a job needs in a certain format for a patient, you fill it out. Or if mm-hmm. it's, you know, an insurance company needs you to spend time talking to a doctor to doctor call with somebody, at the insurance company to explain why your patient needs a test. You know, that takes that takes time. I um, and, mm-hmm. and it's and that's what sort of Chris and I were talking about in that article. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I, th- I think there's a reason, you know, I went back to the health center space and um I and and there I thought well let's create an innovation center, um, mm-hmm. but it is a sort of an oxy uh, not an, I don't know if it's an oxymoron to to it, it to innovate and operate is sort of like um, rubbing your belly and patting your head because <laughs> You're pretty good at that. Um, <laughs> 
because innovation is like um, it's focused on experimentation and taking risks and not with people's health, but with processes. You know, you're like, mm-hmm. let's try this new process. And um, and you're you're focused on speed and, and agility. And then operations mm-hmm. is like you want to do the same thing every time. You know, you want to mm-hmm. be you're focused on like current profit and current sustainability and not future growth. Mm-hmm. So there. I, I found as much as we sort of talked about, hmm, let's let's separate this innovation center. We were still part of this larger organization mm, that mm-hmm. it's really hard to operate health centers these days. I mean, I I love my the executive team at the health center, which I'm still working there part time. Which one um, is this? This is Tapestry, Tapestry 360, 360 right? That's right. Um, okay. I mean, we have such a great team. We the, the staff there are amazing. The the executive team is amazing. The constraints on, you know, health centers, all of the things that we have to report out on, it's it's really hard to do innovation within it. And I, I, mm. I so now I'm getting finally to your question of like, why did I start my own practice? I think it's pretty obvious <laughs> now. <laughs> well, a little bit about me, like I sure. <laughs> convincing other people and trying to like advocate to the people that are, you know, regulating healthcare, that's a lot of work. And, and for yeah. me having a space that, um, you know, you don't have insurance companies, you, you have less of the bureaucracy mm-hmm. and I'm able to, in a small scale with, with, with my patients and it's just two of us, me and a care coordinator, mm. we're able to, you know, really respond to, um, to the people in the system, mm-hmm. uh, you know, us as a care team and the patients, and we're able. There's not. There's really not anything else. There's. Mm-hmm. There's. We have to interact with pharmacies and, and hospitals sure. in some ways, but we're, it's a. It's a much more controlled system, and we're able to, to continuously iterate to get the process right. And so I'm, I'm constantly asking my patients for feedback, and and I'm I'm going to be working with a, a designer who's helping me pro bono. Um, to start interviewing my patients and really learn about, we, we started setting up care plans where they mm. can interact with their own mm. care plan. And, oh. but, but, uh, you know, I, I want to learn from them how it's working. And, and so you can do that sort of experimentation again, not on, on decision, medical decision-making. I, I, I don't experiment on that. It's more on the, like, how do we interact and how can we do that better? So you, know? you have, you've given yourself a whole lot of ad- latitude there, but the, the, the question that I'm sure our audience is wondering as well as me, how the hell do you get away from the, uh, you know, the, the boot of the insurance companies? Yeah. So is this, this <laughs> people pay out of pocket? So, yeah. So people, okay. so it's a, it's a, it's a monthly membership. And okay. I think when people start hearing monthly membership, they, they immediately think of, of concierge and they think of, you know, unattainability, like it's this hmm. extra expense and, and concierge practices. Oh, unattainable for them. In for terms them, of the because, oh. it's, you know, it's like, oh, I have my insurance, like I can't afford more. And and, and, okay. and, I, and so the model that I'm doing is called direct primary care. And it's, um, it is a membership model. It is, okay. it is different than, than the sort of traditional concierge practice, which okay. is, um, you know, one of two things, either, either it's usually more expensive than, okay. a, I, I know of a concierge practice on the North side that is, um, or farther up on the North shore, that is, I think $300 a month, you okay. know, for, for my clinic, for an individual, it's $85 a month for a family of three, it's $200 a month. Okay. Um, so that's one difference is there's a price difference. It's, okay. it's more generally more affordable across the country, the direct mm. primary care practices, mm. um, and the second thing is a concierge practice is some, some of them will still bill insurance. So they still have mm. the sort of, the, they still have to write notes that they have to submit to an insurance company mm. to get paid, that sort of thing. Or, you know, they, they bill in code and there's all sorts of staff that you need to do that. So your clinic doesn't deal with insurance so, at all? Oh, wow. So we don't deal with insurance at all. And what, I mean, it, what it immediately appeals to are people who are in situations where they're, for example, buying their own insurance. Um, so they, mm-hmm. they are currently buying an insurance plan that covers like catastrophic or unexpected, you know, needs. Like mm-hmm. if you got in a car ex- or if you mm-hmm. got, you know, um, in a car accident and got hurt and, um, or if you, if you, you know, developed cancer or something like that, then you would use your insurance. Um, if you, um, but it's also paying for preventive care such as, you know, primary care like myself and it the way it pays for preventive care is not is not great i think no. most people agree that <laughs> paying 
per visit and trying to quantify what you did in that visit and then get paid like it, it, it doesn't work well for clinicians and doctors uh -huh. and their offices and it doesn't work well for patients. And so what direct primary care does is it's sort of like it says it's almost takes a car insurance model and say, you know what, insurance should be like car insurance. Like you don't want to use it, but it's there when you need it, okay. you know? And then for the rest of healthcare, let's pay for or let's pay for it at a monthly fee. And then <clears> I I don't, my, my doctor doesn't have to count. Is this a visit or not? We're just in touch. And just to give you an example, I had a patient mm. recently who had texted me and, and then you have just different level of access. So she texted me mm -hmm. using a secure texting app that, that isn't going to buzz me in the middle of the night if the patient doesn't want me to be buzzed, you know, so there's, and of course you got to have boundaries. You're a human being. Uh, so yeah, of course. So you, you create a system so that they, the texting app you use will tell the patient, do you want the doctor to be awoke, you know, awoken in the middle of the night? And they're like, oh, no, they, they wouldn't oh. respond to that. So, huh. so, it's, so it protects you from like, you know, where you can still have a family life. But, but if you need to be, if you need to be um, um, accessed by the patient, you mm. can. Mm -hmm. And so just to give this example of this patient, so she um, texted me on a Friday and mm. she's, she had some symptoms mm. in her ear. And I, I ended up talking to her over text and then we, we talked on the phone quickly and, and we, we decided to give it a day or two. Um, okay. and then it was the weekend and she, she, she texted me and then she said it was an urgent. So it, it buzzed me and I, I talked to her or I, I said, you know what, let's meet in the clinic at a time that was mutually convenient uh -huh. on a Sunday. Okay. Um, my, my kids had swimming, so my wife took them there and I went to the clinic and I, I already knew this patient for a, a few weeks, but I had gotten to know her really well in her, our initial encounter. We spent like an hour and a half together. I felt like I really knew her. And so it was, you know, it was nice to see her again. I, uh, unfortunate circumstances because she was, you know, having these symptoms, but I, I got to look in her ear and, and some of the other symptoms she was having, she had some facial like eye swelling mm -hmm. and, and we made a plan right there. And, and I actually had antibiotics in my clinic because mm. direct primary care, we also, we, we, we become the middle person for meds and labs too. So we're able to get uh. patients um, very, so patients who, who then get, you know, health, health insurance plans mm -hmm. or health shares that are more for <clears throat> catastrophe, they have to pay out of pocket for their health med, meds and labs. Well, we get them extremely cheap um, meds and labs. So I had, I mean, it was like $7 for her antibiotics, which is on the more expensive end, but it's still it's only seven and then she just pays out of pocket for that so or? she yeah and it, and it i don't even i don't have to accept cash so administratively it's just part of her electronic medical record she already has a credit card on file and she you know i paid for the meds from the wholesale med company and uh -huh. she pays me back basically oh. um at cost and so terrific it's amazing and same thing with labs so she they if this patient didn't get a lab that day but if, if for my other patients who get labs mm -hmm. you know basically the labs cost, you know, five dollars for um, for a complete blood count, mm -hmm. four dollars for a com comprehensive metabolic panel, which is like your kidney liver function, mm -hmm. seven dollars for a cholesterol panel. They're really really cheap, and it's through Quest, so it's not mm -hmm. through um, you. Know, but we just get really good negotiated prices that are on my website. You can go look at the website, and oh, it's transparent. It's yeah, oh, it's exactly. not some mystery because I like the mystery. Where's the mystery? Exactly. I like going to the hospital and not knowing what the hell I'm paying for. And then there's this whole, I remember when I was uh, contemplating um, a surgeon when I mm -hmm. had an issue with my back and I just simply asked one question, like how much would this cost? And it set off this whole exactly. like negative a anxious, horrible response from the rep. It was weird. Yeah. It was so obvious yeah. that so much of healthcare is veiled in this mystery. Yeah. yeah. And so that's so refreshing to hear. Yeah. And so, and, and uh, speaking of price, like there's n none of this phone call, this text message, this visit with her, I'm her and I, neither of us are worried about how much is this going to, that's all included, you know? So there's, and, and then. Cause that's a huge uh, source of anxiety yeah. for a patient. How much is this going to cost exactly. as opposed to how can I get the health care that I need? And for you, you're not worried about that. It's all good. I'm here to serve you. Exactly. I'm making a decent living. I don't need to gouge the hell out of you. Exactly. I don't need to like speak to like I'm not accountable for my overseers who are telling me you got seven minutes with each patient. Exactly. And that's how it is. Exactly. Exactly. So you know, interesting to see how her story played out. So this is a Sunday, and then 
I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, mm -hmm. at, at least four days that week, we texted. She sent me pictures um, and we checked in over text. And mm -hmm. it was interesting thinking about that. I was talking to some one of my, one of my friends and, and I was like, that didn't feel like work. You know, when, some, when a patient reaches out to you who you don't even know who the patient is, it's like, <laughs> okay, now I have to get to know this patient. Like if I'm on call mm -hmm. for somebody else's patient versus a patient of mine who I'm worried about and I want to make sure that she's okay, text me a status update, that actually feels good. You know, like I, I want to know how she's doing, you know, and so, so the... Um, this is all about bringing <laughs> about humanity out in people. Exactly. I mean, exactly. everything you're saying is precisely what my problem with traditional healthcare yeah. in this country is. Yeah. There's so many forces that like deplete the humaneness from us, yeah. doctors included. Yeah. You yeah. can. T I can tell where they're just kind of like succumb to the system because it's overwhelming and so powerful and controlling and totally. you thank god you're you're <laughs> you're creating a model and and i i mean were you one of the first to do this type of model no, no not at all I've, oh okay um, and you know and one thing i'll say and i'll close out that story is like the, the the nice thing about all of that is you know all six of those encounters that we had were Neither her or I are measuring them and thinking about like, okay, how, how am I going to get paid for this or how am I going to pay for this? And, mm -hmm. and then also, um, I think this day and age when I talk about direct primary care, people are like, yeah, but do we need primary care? Like I, I could just go to an urgent care. And I think her mm. example, if she went to an urgent care, yeah, she could have the visit that she had with me on the Sunday, but she's not going to get those five days of follow up. You know, she's not... And the people in the urgent care actually exactly. do care. You know, they want to, but they don't, they're not positioned to have the follow-up. Their job exactly. isn't to have the follow-up. Exactly. So, oh, that's a huge point. So there, there's something, so there's something missing in, in sort of eliminating good primary care from a system where we're just like, okay, I could just go to an urgent care, you know, and I, I think for, certainly for people with lots of chronic disease, it doesn't work. But I think even for people who don't have a lot of chronic disease, like would, would like to have a, a good primary care model, but the current primary care model doesn't work for most people because, you know, you get to see them once a year and it feels very mechanical and not very personal. So very well said. That's so, exactly how I felt. I felt anytime I've seen, I mean, yeah. it's just a waste of time. I remember coming home to my wife after seeing a prime. And the only reason why I went there is because I needed, I needed specific meds or I needed some blood work. And every single time I would say to my wife, that was a waste of time. <laughs> it's too sad because it's too bad because the, the people Just, working in it, if you're feeling like it's a waste of time, then it, 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 it certainly is less motivating for, for the people working. Totally. In it. And people who are going saying, why can't I just get go to the urgent care clinic? What is the motivation behind that? As you were talking, I couldn't help think, well, they're worried about the money. They're worried about yeah. that this, this system that is... Um, for what you know just in general is antithetical to their overall wellness and yeah. and and yeah. well-being and so when they're but everything you're saying is speaking directly to what i was hoping healthcare could be yeah. which is you want the doctor to understand you people want to be heard people want to be understood and healthcare is one of the most important parts of their lives where they need to be understood yeah. i mean i can't tell you how many doctors, when I hurt my back and had a herniated disc and I was in pain and then it collapsed and I was in serious pain yeah. and to have a, a young, arrogant doctor try to tell me something about my body that I knew and they're saying, no, I think it's a circulation issue. And I'm like, you're not hearing oh me. My God. You are not hearing me. Yeah. And she was like, and then it became defensive and all this other nonsense. And I was just like, oh, my God. And, of course, she was completely wrong. Yeah. Completely yeah. wrong. And But the point is, is that she's part of a system, yeah. unfortunately, that she was embodying. And, um, and you know, I it, it, it's hard to be patient with folks when you see this consistently over time and it has people withdraw. But what you're talking about is very, very inspiring where it actually injects the humanity back in one of the most humane things that somebody can do, which is practice healthcare and medicine and be a real 
of service to people. And so that's the the reason why I'm so interested in um yeah. you know in doing this series which you are now a part of which is looking at incentive structures and oftentimes we're incentivizing all the wrong behavior not all the time but oftentimes which yeah. are leading to detrimental outcomes. So what you're doing is you looked at these incentive structures very specifically and very analytically and now you're realizing there's a problem with it and you've redesigned them and now you've started your own clinic um and a how has it been going and b i think you mentioned you know like you've you you talked about in this article um the production line and solution line um being in the same place mm. and that has really helped quite a bit um so if you could speak to that about how your clinic is going now, because you started it. How old is it? About a year old, you said? Or I started in August, so four months. Oh, sure. yeah. Oh my God. Like, this is brand new. And like, you know, how's it going? What have you, you know, uh, what challenges have you had to deal with? And also, could you please speak to how you've gotten the, the, the production line, which is the, you know, the process that you have to deal with, and the solution oriented, which is really the humaneness. How that. Being in one place has, has seemed to help. Yeah, and I and I think your your question earlier about like you know am I one of the the first people doing this and um and I and and how did I end up starting them? A few things were mixing in my head. Um, sure. I mean, one thing I'll say is I I had the one of the places I worked in the past however many years ago it was twenty sixteen I think mm-hmm. um was a organization called Iora Health and mm. we were doing um value based care meaning we were getting paid um per member per month basically so like okay. sort of like me as an individual now mm-hmm. uh, members are, are patients are are becoming members <clears throat> and they're paying me a monthly membership fee and and so that way of doing primary care I had some experience doing mm-hmm. that okay. at, but it was more it was more corporate it was a large organization okay. but but I still had the satisfaction of, you know, if a patient calls, if my patient calls, we're their doctor and we'll care for them. And we don't worry about, you know, is this a visit and how much do we code it at to mm-hmm. how much do we bill it? Like, so I, I had the experience of working in, in a value-based care setting by, and the, the, the person who founded the organization, his name is Rashika Fernando Pool, And he, he started as a direct primary care doctor. So the reason I brought this up is he was probably one of the first direct primary care doctors, um, you know, 15, 18 years ago. Mm. It wasn't, there wasn't really a field of direct primary care, but he was one of the sort of innovators. And okay. so there's been people across the country. There's, I don't even know the numbers, but at least 2,000 direct primary care doctors. Oh. Um, so I have a really good friend, two good friends that I did residency with who have been doing it for one's been doing it for three years, one's been doing it for six years. And Mm -hmm. um, I I think one of the key things in direct primary care, and it it sort of gets to, you were talking about humanity, is the small business piece of it is actually an important piece of it because (laughs) I've always liked small businesses. I've always felt like the the care that happens when somebody like owns their own small business and like when you're a customer there, Mm -hmm. you can feel the sort of love and care that goes into the you know the work they they do and i know that large businesses the standardization that can happen there could be really good from a quality standpoint Mm -hmm. um but it really depends on what what it is that you're creating and so if you're (laughs) if you're um if it's if it's healthcare, if it's primary care the relationship matters so much Mm -hmm. um and sort of standardizing across every single interaction probably matters less in some ways Mm -hmm. you don't want you know, if I'm interacting with somebody who is 60 years old and is has multiple medical illnesses and is, is going through a divorce and, and somebody else is 30 and just had their second baby and, you know, like, and I don't know, had, like their life circumstances are really different. And mm-hmm. so you might want to sort of standardize the way that they schedule an appointment, you know, but you probably, the actual interaction needs to be somewhat customized to that individual. Totally. Um, and so, I mean, this is so like obvious, yeah. but yet we have to talk about it because it's, you know, how things are happening are antithetical to that. So yeah, please. exactly. So, 
so, um, so I think that's part of the reason that when I was working in this other company, Iora, I sort of thought about like, God, this, this would be great if we could sort of have a little bit more control over our individual clinics, you mm. know? Mm. Um, and, and that, and, and this direct primary care movement, I feel like is it's a grassroots movement every mm. i mean it's hard starting your own clinic and uh-huh. and you know i i'm in some ways i'm doing a lot of like meeting people at chamber of commerce events and and going uh-huh. out and, uh-huh. and you know like i never i never thought of myself as in marketing or, or sales but but you are when now you start your own business <laughs> yeah you're yeah. and in some ways it's it's fun because you're you you it's energizing talking to people and hearing their stories in healthcare like makes me more motivated that I'm, mm. you know, on the right path. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, every, I, I, I have to learn about like, you know, getting our computer systems up our, mm-hmm. our, you know, all, all of the insurances you need, all of that stuff. It's, it's not minor and it's been, right. <laughs> you know, I've had the support of my wife. My father-in-law is basically my CFO. I joke cause he's, you know, he's, he's a finance guy. And so he's oh. helped me out a lot. Um, so you get like Thank a God. lot of free help from your friends Same and with family. my wife. Yeah, exactly. She does <laughs> that for our business. Oh, absolutely. It's been, it's been great. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, oh, well, I wanted to also mention, you know, like, um, I, I wanted you to touch on, you know, the solution shop for, yeah, yeah. between the production line. And you mentioned, I believe in the article, how, having them in the same place doing these rather, you know, systemic type of things that you need to do, like you were saying, versus the real, um, the real healthcare and how having that in the same place has streamlined and let uh, uh, the, the whole process and yeah. l- allowed you to be more effective in, you know, administering healthcare. Yeah. I think that that's, and I, that's a good point. I, a lot of my research and my writing has hopefully is, is, a, is, isn't necessarily critical of the idea of the production line, the idea of like making sure all of our patients get preventive care, you mm-hmm. know, like if, you know, everybody should have a cholesterol screen at some point and, and their blood pressure check, like For sure. I'm, I'm certainly in support of all that. I think right. that the focus on these very measurable, you know, few things has, has overtaken the, the sort of human interaction trust building, which we're mm-hmm. calling the solution shop. So, so I, I think what we realized in, in, in sort of conceptualizing this paper is that it's hard to separate those two things. You know, you can't mm-hmm. be in the middle of a, an interaction where you're talking about somebody's diabetes, for example, where you were like, okay, I need to make sure that, that we do a foot exam and refer them for an eye exam mm-hmm. and check their sugar levels and check how their medications are doing. And uh, without asking the patient, how are you doing? And and if they say, well, I've been dizzy lately, you can't be like, oh, you know, I got all these things to get through. That doesn't fit the form, man. Exactly. That doesn't fit. I have all fit. these things to get through. I don't have time for that. So you have get to- Get in the box. <laughs> Exactly. So I think I think that's what happens is I I've I've experienced that myself in mm-hmm. the in the quick fifteen minute visits where you're all by where you're sort of by yourself, you're like getting through all of these things and then the patient's like, I've been dizzy and you're like, Ugh, you know <laughs> Do I have time for that? I was going through this and totally. and like which is sad. It's sad because like what's more important than addressing a patient need, you know, like exactly. It's 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 more important than everything else I'm talking about. Exactly. But like <laughs> exactly, m- the people who are holding me accountable, and this gets back to this whole accountability, uh-huh. can't measure whether I made a good diagnosis on their dizzy spell. Mm-hmm. You know that uh, you know what I think this is dehydration, or I think you actually might have um, you know something called BPPV, which is like benign vertigo. Um, whether I make a good diagnosis there, nobody's nobody is measuring that, but they are measuring whether or not that patient got their foot exam or their eye exam. So you mm-hmm. can see why we as doctors are like making sure we do the production line at the expense of the solution shop. So totally. I think, I think the answer is how do you design? And when you know, I, I've been working a lot of team-based models where I had you know another person in the room with me and were able to do both. You know, a so medical assistant. A, a medical assistant was like sort of scribing with me, and that that I think you listened to my other podcast. Yeah, what was the term you used for the medical? There was a care team coordinator. Care team coordinators. Yeah. CTC. CTC. That's right. Right. Okay. So. So those up. are critical. Those, those are those are critical, and those so people. it's it's in a model where you're seeing you know 15 minute visits. I found that I'm able to do. My 15 minutes, if I'm working with somebody who's so I, in this model, I had a CT, two CTCs, so two, mm-hmm. um, so 
they would go in the room with a patient and they would build rapport. They mm-hmm. would hopefully know them from a prior visit too. Right. So they build relationships and they would build rapport, build up an agenda, take care of some of the agenda items, like some of the production line items like um, colon cancer screening. You can get a colonoscopy or you can give your stool and check it for blood microscopically. Well, they'll just do that. They'll just order the the referral to the gastroenterologist or the Mm -hmm. stool test. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I don't they don't that doesn't need me, you know, and then I come in to help address the disease spell, you know, and the foot exam, it's already ready. And I just do the foot exam really quickly. So having two people and they're in the room typing. And Mm -hmm. so in that, that model where you have 15 minutes, that's a way that you can do both, you know, as Mm -hmm. as good as you can. And then I feel like my patients were got eye contact the whole time from me. I actually could pick up on nonverbal cues typing the whole time <laughs> in my current practice be- because i i have you know a smaller patient load and i have more time i don't have this model but mm-hmm. you know it, i mean i think that um there could be room for it um in in the direct primary care space where the, where the patient has a care coordinator and a doctor that they know really well and that they can lean on for for different things you mm. know so um, but I, I haven't sort of gotten that far in deciding. For for example, if you, if a patient, I'm I, I speak Spanish, but not um, I'm not a native speaker, and I mm-hmm. um, and I don't speak perfectly. Um, mm-hmm. But if I, you know, you have a, a, a care team coordinator who um, is a native Spanish speaker, and you have an, and somebody who speaks only Spanish, um, it might be you know more. Um, comforting to them to be able to um, speak more naturally and have mm-hmm. a care coordinator present throughout the whole <coughs> encounter, that sort totally. of thing. So um, we'll see where that goes. But mm. but I think you either have to have the time and the space, like I have in my direct primary care practice, mm. to do the solution shop and the production line because you have more time. Or if you're in a, a more time-constrained model, then you have to have two people. Mm. Yeah. So that, that was basically the concept. But honestly, writing that article... And sending it to one of my friends who does direct primary care, and he's like, "You should do direct primary care." That was probably one of the things that was like, "You know what? I think I'm going to do it." When did you write this article? 2022. Um, so uh, I think it got published last, yeah, mid summer 2022, and I decided around then to uh-huh. to start moving in the direction of um, of you know I started I started at that point learning more mm. my my initial sort of um, foray into into moving in this direction was mm-hmm. just learning you know I, mm-hmm. I went to a conference I read about it I listened to podcasts um, <laughs> and I hear that can be very helpful <laughs> <laughs> I love podcasts <laughs> yeah me too um, so yeah oh that's I mean I mean but it's such a daunting thing to think about yeah. I mean to to be an entrepreneur is a whole nother level. Yeah. Yeah. of uh endeavor that is can you know is it's scary especially when you're you know providing for a fan you've got a family mm. you've got three kids did you say three kids three uh, how old are your kids um my daughter <coughs> turned 12 yesterday okay 12 on 12 12 okay. special day um, Good luck and with then that. i have a <laughs> okay a nine-year-old and a six-year-old oh um, so yeah you got yeah. your hands full yeah. and you are the i mean you've got a you know you can't mess this up yeah, <laughs> you know you're yeah, kind of exactly, playing a critical exactly, role exactly. so yeah, yeah you need a team around you that cares about you yeah. and that is you know championing you to be successful for yeah. sure yeah. um and so <clears throat> about how many patients do you have right now I have 15 members um, mm-hmm. who are signed up, um, which is is good. I've seen a, I, I, you know, I think that some it's good for, from my standpoint. Mm-hmm. It's it's I probably started in August with I, I saw a few people because people didn't know what this was. I, I was mm-hmm. seeing some patients for urgent care. So mm-hmm. I saw some people who needed to be seen that day, didn't weren't um, interested in, in the model or, 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 um, and they were sort of, um, transiently in, in Evanston. So somebody was visiting a friend and they needed to be seen. So things like that. So Mm -hmm. I, I really only had one member in August and then one or two more in September. And so it's, it's, it's starting to pick up more oh, lately terrific um, and how do people find out about your clinic and you they could i'm on i'm on social media i was never used to be on social media but we have um, instagram facebook linkedin how do they um, find you just look for your name they could google bridge direct care bridge direct care all one word it's dot um, com they 
it's bridgedirectcare.com or they could Google bridge direct care separate words and Very they good. should be able to find bridge like okay. uh, like a bridge. Uh, the reason the word uh, I could tell why we p- chose the word bridge, but um, and then they could they could Google my name Jeff Panzer. Um, they can go to you know go to our website. There's a ton of information there. P a n z e r right. P a n z e r right. Yeah. And so and how could people find out more about direct primary care? Is there a particular um, source of information that you would recommend people learn about this model? That is a good question. So on on my website, under there's a tab that says news, and there's um, I've pulled a few clips. Mm. There's there's actually a PBS special on my website. That, really? That um, shows a, a model in Wisconsin. I think mm-hmm. that's a great. It's like an eight minute segment. There, on my website, there's also a three minute sort of cartoon clip about what direct primary care oh, is. Oh, great! I think those are two good ones. They're I'm not familiar. There, there's certainly websites to help us doctors mm. make the transition, but for patients, I'm not familiar if there's an actual website that um, is is purely educational for patients. There are websites. There's a website called the DPC Frontier that has a has a mapper on it. Okay. So, or you can look for a DPC mapper, and you could find the deep direct primary care practices oh. in your in your area. Oh, that's um, terrific. And so I will say for my, you asked about my numbers and my startup being as far as I know there there are definitely concierge practices in the area. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know of other direct primary care practices in Skokie, Evanston, um, you know, in this area. Okay. Um, in I have friends and colleagues who have started in other states where mm. they have more direct primary care and and it's actually a lot easier to start because people are familiar. So I'm oh. out there. You know, oh. every patient that joins is is pretty much learning about this concept afresh. And, and oh, so, so it's less familiar in Illinois than in other states. Where um, is it more familiar? What other? You know, state? I th- I think it, it it's probably regional in other states, but I know like Colorado, Washington huh. State. There oh. are certain states that um, I I mean, this is more anecdotal. I don't have sure. the um, the exact numbers, but mm-hmm. um, certain states and certain geographical regions starting a practice, it's it's it can be easier to build a practice because there's already sort of a precedent, and people are already, you know, shifting from health insurance to using a health share, for example, which uh-huh. pairs really well with a DPC. Um, oh, interesting. And so, so are there are certain like rules and laws and regulations from state to state make it easier to start a direct primary yeah, care practice question. in certain states versus others that you might know of? Um, yeah, there's a lot of legislation around deep. What, what's nice about direct primary care is it's 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 bipartisan, like nationally. Oh, really? It gets it gets support um, on both both sides of the aisle. It, Interesting. You know, in a lot of ways, because it's it's a decrease on bureaucracy. You know, it's basically uh-huh. like, um, and so there's 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 bipartisan support. Um, some states have certain laws that make uh, basically you can be a direct primary care in in all fifty states. I think there's. There probably are drug primary cares in all 50s. Last I heard, there was 49, but I think North Dakota now has one. I don't know. Something. I'm really curious um, to, like, if I investigated, I wonder what health insurance companies are doing to um, inhibit yeah, DPCs. That's a good you know, I, I, I'm curious. Have you, like, uh, come across any static or friction in terms of things they're doing to try to thwart doctors from starting these type of practices or making it difficult for them in some way? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think that on the national level, the direct primary care is is, or in, in in all the states that have laws around direct primary care, are basically to say that direct primary care is not insurance because if it is considered insurance, then it's regulated in a, in a certain way. And okay. direct primary care, people are paying you a monthly fee, but you're not. It's not insurance. You're not insuring them if they go to a hospital. You're not. You're, it's not doing all mm. of the things that insurance does. So, mm. so the states that have enacted laws protecting direct primary care, I think I'm not an expert here. Sure, but, sure. Um, there's there's a there's a DPC doctor slash lawyer named Phil SQ who who created the DPC Frontier, mm. um, which is a good resource. And he he's I've listened to his podcast where he talks about. Um, some of the laws around it, but anyway, the the um, some states have don't have laws, and I think Illinois is in this case that um, so there always could be a law that could make it harder for direct primary. So I'm wondering, and you know, and um, 
Because, you know, the, the relationship between politicians and corporate America, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah. is a problem. So. I mean, yeah, and, and I certainly hope, like, I, I've heard that the, the DPC movement is not anti-insurance. It's just more like insurance makes sense for things that you don't happen that much and sure. you don't want to happen. But for primary preventive you know, the everyday care uh -huh. that we can do at direct primary care, it's probably paid for in a better, in a different way. And, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. That's not Although I think insurance company executives might disagree with your perspective that it's, but I mean, yeah. you know, cause that's going to cut into their, their profits to some degree. Pro I mean, uh, obviously it's a much better system yeah. uh, clearly, but uh, what I'm also looking at is like, you're now incentivizing, creating a structure in your clinic to incentivize, um, real care and yeah. and and bring out the humaneness in people, both the patient and the doctor. And insurance companies will see that as you know, if it grows, if it really continues to grow. And you know, in terms of like analyzing what percentage of people go to direct primary cares versus you know not care doctors rather. And so that'll be something to look at and something you know all direct primary care doctors should be cognizant of. And also, it would be interesting to look at moving forward um, yeah. how polit what politicians are embracing this model for real because they might have a problem raising money from these particular people. I mean, it, it, that's, yeah, the, that's that, true. The, I mean, we're, you cannot get away from the, the profit motive yeah. here. And yeah. so that explains a lot. But the bottom line is you're doing it. Yeah. And and other people are doing that, and it's been around for to over a decade. Did you say? Yeah, to about fifteen years. Did you say? Um, yeah, 10? I would say ten to fifteen years, okay. depending on on how it how official it was. Um, but yeah, there. Um, and one thing, one comment I'll make about the um, mm. insurance companies is, mm -hmm. is, you know, yeah, direct primary care. I I do. If a patient asks me, oh, I'm going to do direct primary care. Do mm -hmm. I need insurance? I would say. I would say yes. I encourage people to have coverage for because because direct primary care will cover the. It's always <coughs> oftenly quoted eighty to ninety percent of your healthcare needs. You know, mm -hmm. if you have a chronic disease that you need to see a specialist for. You know, like that. That's outside of us as direct primary care. Exactly. You, exactly. you know, if you broke your arm, I you know you'd need to see an orthopedic surgeon, right. for example. And so, right. um, so you know, I I definitely, but I I do have patients and who don't have insurance, you know, and, and, mm -hmm. and, and I'm more than happy to see them. You know, I told you my history of working in Africa and working with mm -hmm. underserved populations. Um, so in some ways I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I have some uninsured patients. I have some patients who have like good employer based insurance, but they're looking for better primary care. And then I have some people who mm. are, you know, have very high deductible plans that that make it really hard to get health care. And so they're they're coming to me and they're like, oh, this is a perfect fit. I could, you know, get good primary care. And then mm. I have insurance for catastrophe, but it's really hard for me to use that because of the high deductible. You know? It seems like there should be like some nationalized, you know, I'm just speaking off the top of my head, like a national health insurance pl plan that, you know, takes care of catastrophic and some other stuff. And then you could go to a direct primary care yeah. and pay out of pocket for some hybrid in that way. I mean, there's so much that could be innovated because our current system is so like horrible in so many yeah. ways. And now you're providing this, this model that when we first met, I mean, it just blew me away. I never <laughs> heard about this. Yeah. Never. Yeah. Do most people that you encounter know about this healthcare model just mm. randomly in general in your life? I mean, I know you walk in the circles of the medical community, obviously, but most people that I talk to, I would say the majority of people don't know what this is. Yeah. Which, um, which makes my job of, you know, it's interesting. I go to chamber events and I, I'm meeting people. Chamber of commerce. Chamber of commerce yeah, events. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, and I'm, it, I'm not just talking about my business, which is really like, you know, my services. I'm sort of myself, of um, course. but I'm also talking about this new, th so it's sort of a double thing. It's, mm -hmm. it's like, it's not like I'm like, Hey, I started a practice and mm -hmm. you know, it's like I'm started this practice that is a very different way, um, and special way, and and you know innovative way to provide mm. provide healthcare. So mm -hmm. it's a sort of a double, you know, and, mm -hmm. and 
Um, so yeah, that, that, that is, and my father-in-law said that when I started, he's like, you're going to have to be educating <laughs> a lot of people about what this is and why it's different. Totally. You know? I mean, I, I remember we were about to leave the event and I just introduced myself to you. And then next thing I know, my <laughs> wife was like, dang, he's really in involved in this conversation. Yeah. And I just, it's like, oh my gosh, this is in, this is great because healthcare is so important to me in so many ways. I mean, there's no way around the fact that people are going to need to interact with the healthcare system at some point, no matter how healthy you think you are, how well you eat or you work out or whatever. So like life has a tendency to put you on your butt every now and again, and you're going to have to deal with it. And you're going to have, you want to go to a system and interact with a a professional in this field that gives a crap about you, that gives a damn and is well-versed in you. Yeah. And everything you've spoken to is so inspiring. I'm so happy that you are here on the show to talk about this. And I was just wondering before we wrap up, if, if is there anything um, in your practice now that you're, you know, it's so new, it's yeah. only months old, that you realize like we got to do that better, or we could like, have you? Is it evolving as you're going in the moment? Yeah, it is. And that's one of the things that I, I've I've been um, appreciating about about starting slow um, mm-hmm. is that I I'm yeah of course are we technologically we had a I have an electronic medical record that is also a communication platform and a billing platform it sort of does all three mm. but the communication piece of it had some challenges so I ended up adding a new technology um, that is the 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 secure text messaging app slash oh, phone line that oh, I mentioned. That's great. Um, so just, just, just things that you realize, Oh, well that didn't work as well as I thought let's pivot. And so, mm-hmm. um, there's things like that all the time. So my, I, I my colleague who works with me as our, our care coordinator, she's also an office manager. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, <clears throat> when there's two of you, you do everything between the two of you and she's, mm-hmm. she's just working with me part time, but she, um, she's phenomenal. And she, I mean, every time we meet, we're working on, you know, uh, improving. Uh, we're, we're taking care of the patients that we have, but also improving the systems that were the processes right. and the systems. And um, just for example, when a patient signs up and then they schedule their first visit, um, you know, that whole process uh, from beginning to end, we're, we're continually making it better. And, mm-hmm. and the, the forms that patients fill out, we, this is the nice thing about having your own practice. You're not sort of told, here's the form that a patient fills out. Like, I want to make it fit the patient and my needs in terms of gathering information. So so you, you constantly my make ears. it better. It totally, um, like, so yeah, it, to answer I remember question, you like yeah. getting some of these ridiculous forms like, are you depressed? No, why am I even answering yeah, this question? Yeah, why are you asking yeah, me? I'm not yeah. like, I am not coming to you for this. Yeah, I, I don't yeah, know. Yeah. I'm like lit up. Yeah, I, I don't, yeah. it, just the fact that that question can impose a certain feeling and it's just so like, just gets in the way, remove yeah, it. This must yeah. be so freeing for you, yet daunting to some degree to start it, but you're in it, you're flowing, yeah. you're moving. Yeah. Uh, God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> I wish you all the best. <laughs> Seriously, I really mean it. Is there anything that we should know or any other thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience before we wrap up? And by the way, we'll be putting any links that you want us to put in the show notes. We will put them in and I'll confer with you after the fact about that. But if there's any other thoughts that you'd like to convey, please. Um, yeah, I mean, one, just thank you so much for having me. It's oh, been fun. Um, pleasure. It's, it's, it, as you can tell, talking about <laughs> these topics are are fun for me and, and something I think a lot about and I am, I'm, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm happy to talk about. And I, I think that part of the reason that I'm excited about direct primary care is, um, is that the system isn't working well for, for doctors and nurses and care team members and patients alike. You know, it's, it's not working for the people providing care and it's not working, um, for the people who are receiving care. And, um, and I'm, I'm in the traditional model. In the traditional yes. model. So I, th- I think what I'm excited about with direct primary care is, it, is it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's different. Um, in it's forward thinking, and and in some ways going back to a time where we had relationship mm. with doctors. So it's it's innovative in a in a unique way because you're sort of going back to a time where some people, not everybody, had access to you know a doctor mm. in the 1980s and 1990s, but sure. for those who did. You know, 
that sort of more casual like acquaintance that you have with a doctor that that you know my dad dad had with his mm-hmm. patients and his mm-hmm. patients had with him where they actually cared about each other um i think that um we're going you know this movement is going backwards to that sort of relationship mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. um valued time or time where we valued relationships and going forwards where it's 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 tech enabled it's it's meeting people where they're at this day and age you don't need to go in person for a visit um and so so it's really exciting and i and i think i guess i would encourage people who you know the question i get all the time is like do you take insurance i think i'm trying to flip that on its head and say um we don't work for insurance companies and insurance companies don't drive the care that we provide. And so figuring out how to put less money into insurance yes. and, and then, and then people can afford the direct yeah. primary care. And then hopefully someday the government subsidies through Medicaid and whatnot will pay for direct primary care too. So everybody can have a personal doctor and care mm-hmm. team like, like you can get with direct primary care. Amen. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Thanks awesome. Thank you for tuning into the show. If you enjoy this podcast, make sure to subscribe to your more compelling shows on Rhythm of Life and keep an eye out for our upcoming series of how we as a society oftentimes incentivize all the wrong behavior here in the United States. We see this in the healthcare industry, in the media, and in our educational systems to name a few of the fields we will be covering. And this is one of the interviews we will be drawing upon for this series. If you have a moment, please leave a rating and review so more people can hear about us and share about Rhythm of Life on social media and like us on Facebook. Thanks for listening. I'm Steve Hordauer. This has been a Rhythm and Light production. 